A friend and I often talk about the 2002 PS2 game Robotech Battlecry. There's a boss battle in which the main character Jack Archer and his nemesis are teleported to the outer edges of the solar system to wage the final battle. Jack Archer, you have managed to best my finest warriors. Even if you manage to win this battle, you shall surely die with me. Space. Pretty standard cartoon villain stuff here. But what I found so striking about this is that after emerging victorious, Archer's ship simply drifts until he runs out of oxygen. The oxygen's too thin for me to talk anymore. I guess it's a good time to go. Uh, that was the end? We all thought somehow he'd make it back. I remember so many people being revolted about this. What about everything you have to do just to get there? Only to die? How absurd is that? This was the first time that my friend and I grappled with an intriguing existential and ethical dilemma. The implications of which helped us understand a fundamental principle of success that has helped me overcome adversity and is without a doubt one of the main reasons I'm here before you today. Why, after winning this useless battle, did Archer not simply give up? Why bother waiting for his oxygen to run out? To die a quiet, lonely death with no one there to mourn his passing? Why not just end it quickly? The ending confronted us with this kind of thought exercise, forced us to feel, in a very personal sense, the absurd. Anyone who finished that game got that very real sense of it. The answer we came up with helped define a personal philosophy of persistence and requires a brief discussion of existentialism and stoicism. Existentialism is a term used to refer to a 20th century movement that spawned literary, theatrical, philosophical, and other cultural contributions. Its philosophical roots are often traced back to 19th century philosophers Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche because their ontological contributions contributions introduce the question at the heart of existential philosophy. What does it mean to be a human being? Whereas traditional, religious, cultural, and philosophical theories present the idea of human beings as creatures with essential characteristics, namely that what makes you a human being is a set of features and qualities that categorically define you as being human, or that God created you in his image and endowed you with distinct faculties. The existentialist answer is encapsulated by Jean-Paul Sartre's famous phrase, existence precedes essence. This is simplifying it enormously, but the existentialist would say there are no objective, preordained qualities or characteristics that define what it means to be a human being. God, country, and family, all these concepts have no inherent objective value. Any value they do contain is value you ascribe to them. Ultimately, the existentialist would say, once we've realized this, it's our responsibility to give meaning to life. Simone de Beauvoir, one of South's consummate companions and an existentialist and feminist thinker in her own right, provided the following helpful allegory. She describes our evolution from childhood to adulthood as an awakening to the absurdity of life. As children, we're born into a world we did not help establish, which appears to us as given facts which we can only accept. Our parents appear as deities, perfect avatars of behavior to emulate, and we have a clear understanding of what it means to be a good or a bad child. The world thus has clear and easy answers to our questions. Eventually, this solid understanding of the way things work starts to crack as teenagers. We discover the centrality of our subjectivity. We notice the weaknesses and imperfections in adults. We discover reality and that we have to take responsibility for our actions. She says we come to realize our freedom, but it's a mixed blessing. For the teenager, the world is no longer ready-made. Freedom is then revealed and she must decide upon her attitude in the face of it. The existentialist would say the categorical precepts we live our lives by have been devised precisely so that we don't have to take up the responsibility of coming up with an answer ourselves. Because someone has already come up with the answers and given them to you. But these concepts, these ideals, these principles carry no more value than if you come up with them yourself. Meaning it's your responsibility to ascribe them any value or not to. But even if you do, even if you come up with your own set of principles, they don't have any objective inherent value in and of themselves. According to the existentialists, nothing has intrinsic value in the universe. Things just are. They exist. Period. Thus, what it means to be a human being then is how we choose to act in the various situations we find ourselves in. It is how we shoulder the responsibility of giving meaning to life in the face of a universe that has no 
objective, intrinsic value or meaning. Stoicism was a philosophical movement which originated around 300 BCE in Greece, but flourished for about 500 years with periodic bouts of popularity since then. Stoic philosophy was different than other philosophical disciplines in that the Stoics thought of philosophy as very practical. It was something you practice in your life every day. Discussion of Stoic thought tends to focus on their theories of ethics, but they develop robust theories on logic and physics as well. And their notion of individuality is considered a significant philosophical contribution. The Stoics viewed the universe as a single entity driven by reason, and the aim of a virtuous person was to align your inner reason with the outward manifestation of universal reason. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius was a known Stoic adherent and once said, Universal nature's impulse is to create an orderly world. It follows then that everything now happening must follow a logical sequence. If it were not so, the prime purpose towards which the impulses of the universal reason are directed would be an irrational one. Remembrance of this will help you face many things come. Marcus Aurelius is basically saying here that everything happens for a logical reason. Because if things didn't happen for logical reasons, all existence, the entire universe would be irrational. Where have I heard that before? However, scholars have noted that action is the practical end of Stoic philosophy and this is what calls for ethical guidance. Stoic ethics focused on the question, what should be the character of human conduct in the face of trials and adversity that affect us throughout life? Stoics believed it was critical to control the influence of emotions on one's judgment. To do so, the Stoics refer to the doctrines of apathy and self-sufficiency. This is not apathy in the modern sense of being indifferent or having a lack of enthusiasm or concern. It's described as the ability to prevent your emotions from overriding your reason or faculties of judgment, to avoid making bad judgments. On this topic specifically, Epictetus, a first century freed slave and prominent Stoic thinker once wrote, What upsets people is not things themselves, but their judgments about the thing. For example, death is nothing dreadful, but instead the judgment about death that it is dreadful, that is what is dreadful. So when we're upset or distressed, let us never blame someone else, but rather ourselves, that is, our own judgments. Regarding self-sufficiency, he wrote, Some things are up to us, and some are not up to us. Our opinions are up to us, and our impulses, desires, aversions, in short, whatever is our own doing. Our bodies are not up to us, nor are our possessions, our reputations, or our public offices, or that is, whatever is not our own doing. The things that are up to us are by nature free, unhindered, and unimpeded. What is within your control is your way of dealing with appearances. Essentially, the Stoic ideal is a person who develops inner toughness by focusing on her inner faculties and resources so as not to be deterred or influenced by external circumstances, which quite often could be negative or downright absurd. So, applying these two disciplines to our thought exercise, my friend and I came up with a twofold response encapsulated by these two philosophies. First, the action we would decide to take would be to try to get back to Earth, regardless of the futility of the effort, regardless of its chances of success. It's really a philosophy of intentionality. If, for example, you adopt the existentialist thesis that there is no objective meaning to life, then in theory, you or anyone could have given up on life from the time of your birth. Well, maybe not from the time of your birth since there are exigent circumstances that would prevent you from doing that. But under the existentialist thesis, one could have given up on life from the moment of becoming aware of its ultimate absurdity. Our answer in this context is to just keep going. Under this thesis, Archer's life had been absurd since before he ended up at the end of the solar system, before he became a fighter pilot, since his birth. The absurd stretches farther and much wider than we initially thought or really understood. So all the actions and decisions taken since that moment of consciousness or awakening, as Simone de Beauvoir put it, are an effort to give meaning in a state of meaninglessness. And just as likely, one can decide not to do that. One can just accept to stop or passively wait for the end to come. Again, under the context of this thought exercise, there's no moral inferiority for deciding to do so. But we decided to define our existence as human beings by taking actions that would honor the decision to keep going, no matter what, no matter how. To take actions to maximize your potential to keep taking another action and another one to keep existing. Second, this internal and philosophical decision to keep going is paired with a stoic commitment to doing the most fundamental, basic, most elementary thing that you can do to guarantee that your goal will be met. So stoic in the sense that it's an internal, apathetic, 
non-emotional, just a cold, just dead set determination that once you set a goal to make sure your goal comes to pass. This means even if there's a less than 1% chance of it actually happening, if that 1% is all you have, then you just commit to doing whatever it takes to do it. Cold, no matter how ludicrous, no matter how simple, no matter how difficult, no matter how time consuming, no matter how basic and elementary. In other words, just do what will get you to your goal Period. So going back to our thought exercise, if we were stranded in outer space with no chance of ever making it back, our goal, even in this context, would be to try to get back to Earth. How would we achieve that? Well, by walking, or in this case, the equivalent of walking, which would be to set the ship in the direction of Earth and just drifting until you get there, no matter how long it takes, no matter if we would be there to see our action come to fruition. This concept and this practice is what we called walking. We conceive it as the most basic fundamental way to ensure an outcome, to make sure that a goal you've set for yourself will come to completion. Takeaways, the willingness, the drive, the commitment to doing such a monotonous, rote, task in order to get something done. That is what we call walking. This concept applied to other areas of life I found extremely powerful because it instills the mentality to just like doggedly persevere in the face of adversity and obstacles. No shortcuts, no subterfuge, just plain work. I have plenty of other examples like this from friends, family, classmates, colleagues, and mentors. What we've learned is that at some core fundamental level, we've got to be willing to do just that in order to be successful. You have to be willing and capable of exerting that level of work, that level of engagement and effort in as automatic and just dispassionate a way as possible without ever being swayed by the apparent ardor of the task at hand. From that base, you then work on refinement and efficiency to improve your effectiveness and your results. But focusing on efficiency should only happen after having internalized that focus and that hunger and that commitment to doing the most fundamental things that have to get done to make sure your goal is met. Once you've internalized this mentality not to cut corners, then the possibilities manifest themselves because the rigor and effort with which you exert yourself eventually expose you to opportunities. Thanks for watching. Catch you next time.